Hi, I'm Bob, and this is Million Mile Garage, and Matchbox has a birthday this year. They've turned 70 years old. That's right, 70 years of Matchbox. And I've been around for about 56 of those 70 years and been collecting for about, oh, I guess, 53 of them. And I thought it would be fun to share uh, a lot of the Matchbox from what I call the Golden Era, and that's the Lesney Era, Lesney Products. And those were those cars that were built from the very beginnings in the 1950s. And they were built all the way through the early 80s before they got taken over by Universal Group in 1982. Uh, and just pointing out, there were four eras of Matchbox. There was the Lesney era. There was the Universal Group era. There was the Tyco era. And then the current era, which is the Mattel era. And to celebrate this year, Mattel has a whole line of uh, 70th anniversary Matchbox vehicles. Some of them are new castings, like this AMC Concord which kind of got me uh, re-interested in collecting again. I haven't collected for many, many years. Uh, kind of cool. Why don't we start with just the very beginning uh, of how the Matchbox car was born. Uh, and basically, Matchbox had only been around about a dozen years when I was born. So I basically grew up with Matchbox during that golden era called the super fast era. But let's just start with some of the very first models. Uh, so right here for 1953, that's the uh, Hill Dumper. And that was number two in the lineup for 1953. Uh, parked next to it was the cement mixer. That was number three. And then you had the Massey Harris tractor. That was number four. The number one vehicle in the line was the road roller seen here in this reissue set, which was uh, both faithfully and respectfully uh, reproduced in 1992 under Matchbox International. And I'm just going to take this one out and then set it here amongst the other vehicles. So it won't roll away. And just pointing out, this number one road roller was the very first uh, Matchbox model. Couldn't be more different than the rod roller of 1973. You can already see there's that Hot Wheels influence and competition taking place there. Uh, and, but basically how they came about is uh, there were three founding members uh, of Lesney Products, and that was uh, Leslie Smith and Rodney Smith. You can see they just combined uh, the first uh, three letters and last three letters of their first names to form Lesney. Uh, and basically, uh, Jack O'Dell's daughter, he was the third founding member of Matchbox. Uh, he could only, his daughter could only bring a toy to school if it would fit inside the size of a Matchbox. And thus the Matchbox vehicles were born. Uh, they became quite popular. They partnered with a company called Moco. And so that was a joint venture to begin with. And uh, that person's name was Moses Constum, and you can see how they got the abbreviation of that name, and that's why it says a Moco Lesney product. It was a partnership at first. For 1954 uh, is when the numbering system first started to appear on the vehicles. You can see on this London bus, they actually cast it in the, uh, the nose and the rear of the vehicle. As far as I know, that was the only uh, one in the, uh, the lineup of 1954 as well that had a number cast onto it. Uh, they also had the... Uh, Euclid dump truck of 1954. You can see there's there's no numbering system in place. They're kind of made like Tootsie Toys. Uh, in fact, these trucks were so small, it would actually fit in the rear of my number 28 uh, dump truck of 1973. Couldn't be more different, could they? And only about 20 years sets them apart. Uh, same could be said also of the London bus. You can see here, uh, it's much different than my number 17 bus of 1972. They had grown in size uh, drastically. Uh, in fact, after they bought uh, Moses out uh, in the 50s uh, is when the company really started to prosper and you can see here their number 14 Dambler ambulance of around 1955 had grown in size by 1958 and it also grew a base plate and now the numbering system is in place and it's kind of cool even though they retired this casting they kept the same uh, number on it uh, same could be said for the number 13 wrecker uh, my mid 60s wrecker also has number 13 cast on the base and that was something that sometimes they would do with their numbering system uh, when they retired a model, a similar model, sometimes they would keep the same number in place. So there's actually, uh, right, there's actually several number 13s uh, throughout Matchbox's history, but there's two of them right there, that early record of 1955 and of course the mid 60s one uh, right there. Uh, here's just one more from 1955. They had the number 11 petrol tanker, uh, also kind of hollowed out on the bottom. Um, and then they also have another unique one, uh-oh, timber. They had another one here for 55, and that was the Land Rover. Unfortunately, this one's missing its driver. Um, and all of these are, are original, they're uh, you know, early condition. So these are all from 1953 here. So those are 70 years old, actual 70-year-old toys. 
uh, just about mint condition. Uh, these belong to my wife's grandfather. He owned a train set, and he set these around the train set, I guess, in the 50s through the early 60s. So just kind of also following the, uh, the evolution of Matchbox, and never mind the earthquake, uh, by the early 60s, the cars had grown glazed windows. The uh, die-cast zinc wheels gave way to ejection-molded plastic wheels. And you see here that number 57, 1959 Impala. I believe this little gem was built from 1961 to 65. They didn't have interiors yet, though. Kind of cool. Uh, by the mid-60s, like this number 67 Volkswagen 1600 TL. By the way, that's my first Matchbox car ever. Um, they had chrome disc wheels. They had grown interiors. And they also had opening and closing doors. Uh, and that was, you know, that, not every model had it. But that was something that they, they did start to offer. But something happened uh, after they put those disc wheels on in 1968, and that was Mattel. Mattel came on the scene with their flashy Hot Wheels cars. This one's seen in a nice uh, Spectra Flame blue, just a kind of a clear tinted acrylic lacquer over a bare zinc body. Uh, and they had these fast, free-running wheels. This one has the early Delrin inserts, and these were made in Hong Kong. And they were probably sold at a price point, I think, a little lower than Matchbox at first. I, I kind of remember collecting in the 70s. They were all around that, uh, I guess, 39 to 50 cent range. I guess it varied. Um, but these really took Lesney uh, off guard. Uh, but Lesney uh, responded swiftly. In fact, you could say Lesney responded super fast. <laughs> and they came out with their line of super fast vehicles. And right there is an early one. That's a, that's a 1970 base plate. That's the number 23. Volkswagen Camper, and you can see it has a Thin Wheels version because uh, they were in such a haste uh, to respond to Mattel, um, they couldn't uh, redesign all of their models uh, to take wider wheels like the Hot Wheels. Uh, but just showing you some notable models uh, around here, um, you've got this 1972 Maserati Bora. It's got the wide uh, super fast on it. Also opening and closing doors, a feature that some of them had, right? And keep in mind, you know, they were always holding to a certain price point you know, so whether you were paying uh, 50 cents uh, for the camper or, or the Maserati, uh, they usually have some type of feature, right? This one has the opening and closing top uh, right here. And you can see inside the vehicle. But not all of them had that as well. Some of them, you know, they still had fixed features, you know, like this uh, beautiful, uh, I think, number four Pontiac Trans Am of 1975. I'll have to pick him up. Um, Absolutely beautiful model. You know, again, another version of the super fast wheels, wide ones as well. Um, if you were a fan of the Rockford Files series, this would, if this was gold, this would look like the one in the pilot episode, which I think actually was a formula. Uh, pretty cool. Some of the things they did, I kind of, you know, as the, as the company, you know, had a lot of prosperity in the 70s, they could afford to do some flashy things. A lot of vacuum metalized parts, you know, like you can see, it's got basically a chrome interior and then those beautiful uh, amber tinted plastic windshield that just gives it a very cool futuristic look with those dot dash wheels uh, the chrome hood scoops kind of neat uh, probably all one piece right the scoops are probably attached to the interior and then putting the the amber windows on there kind of gives the vehicle a whole new dimension really neat I really enjoyed uh, this era of lesson especially growing up with them you know every year they came out with different models um, and just kind of going around you can see some of the earlier ones I had so there's a uh, a crimson red uh, fire truck. I also have the plain red one. Numbers, uh, 1969 on the base plate. I think it's a number 35. This one did, they always had a plastic chassis, a little odd. Also a thin wheels version. Um, the, uh, I believe the number nine Javelin. Uh, I believe I got that one in 1975 and it's got those five art style wheels. Came with a trailer hitch. Opening and closing doors and they opened and closed. Okay, not bad. Also kind of was neat. It had a uh, contrasting uh, interior, so it's got the black dashboard, and then it's got the yellow interior for a little extra added detail. Kind of neat for that era. Uh, one of my favorites, and I, I was always a favorite, I love those lime metallic colors. Uh, something interesting uh, Matchbox did do, uh, because you know you had the Hot Wheels with the Spectra Flame paints, which was really attractive uh, to, uh, I guess to everybody, right, even to this day. Uh, but you can see here on the piston popper, I think of 1973, they had a different way of doing it. Uh, you can see this one doesn't have the chrome interior, but it does have the, the piston popper feature. This was a Rollomatic, uh, mixing up the two different styles of Superfast. Um, but what they like to do is I think they put a base coat of either white or silver when they did those candyish colors. I think this one has a base coat of silver, so it kind of gives it uh, a different type of luminescence when compared to like the, the Spectra Flame, which was just over a bare zinc body. 
So they always kind of had a little different way of doing things. Uh, some of the things they did to compete uh, with Hot Wheels, I was not real thrilled about because you can see my my beautiful crimson red fire engine of uh, I think originally cast in '69, and then by '75 they had this gizmo, you know, with the the hot rod engine underneath, I guess, and just you know wide wheels, kind of a weird looking deal here. Uh, I think 1975 on the base plate on this one as well. Um, not one of my favorites. Um, I, in fact, I kind of thought when they tried to compete uh, with Hot Wheels, it kind of kind of came off a little uh, kind of odd. Um, I kind of liked the scale detail that most of them had. Some of them it was kind of neat, you know, like Tojo. Uh, I think number 74 Tojo from 1973. Uh, loved the green color. I like the futuristic look. I like the huge windshield. Uh, kind of had a buddy all look to it almost. Kind of cool. Some of them were okay. Uh, a lot of them I could have done without. I really kind of like the scale, you know, type appearance like this Renault here. Uh, the Maserati looked pretty cool. Kind of an odd choice of color, but it worked. Uh, kind of moving around. And then the more industrial stuff like the dump truck. Uh, and just pointing out, you know, how some of the models did change. You, know, you can see here the number 63 Dodge Crane here with the earlier wheels. And then they transitioned over to super fast. And they kind of made their wheels corporate, right? Because they weren't bashful about putting those same wheels on this number 60 uh, uh, Lotus Super 7 of 1971. Uh, just kind of moving around a little bit more here. Some of the uh, cooler ones they did, for me anyway, uh, this was the number one in the lineup for the 75 lineup for 1975. That's the Dodge Challenger. It's sporting a chrome interior but with clear windows, but it does have a textured uh, plastic roof to kind of simulate either a vinyl roof or a convertible. Kind of neat. Uh, love those five arch style wheels on that. Uh, the Planet Scout, not sure what they were thinking, but I still liked it. Uh, I was also a big fan of uh, Space 1999 and Star Trek and all that stuff, and I could just kind of picture this thing kind of rolling across the moon. Kind of wild. I think 1975 was the year on that one. Also mixing it up with two, you know, two different styles of wheels on it. Kind of weird how they did that. Um, but I guess they're kind of trying to keep, you know, Hot Wheels on their toes because Hot Wheels only had that one, you know, style of wheel at first. Uh, oh, also next to it is the uh, the, the uh, Boss Mustang, I think of 1972, and it also has an opening and closing hood, kind of reveal a semi-detailed engine. Really neat features. This one also has the uh, the amber tinted uh, glass that kind of you know makes that chrome interior look a little different. Gives it kind of a kind of a futuristic modern look. Uh, really neat. You know the company did spend you know additional money on some vehicles to, to compete with Hot Wheels to make them flashy, right? Some of them were a little less flashy. You like the hovercrafts here. And by the way, uh, by the 70s, they're already starting to have problems with the numbering system. So you can see this. I think that's the first hovercraft they did. Uh, you can see on there, it says uh, 1972 on the base plate. And then, and then it says number 72, I believe. And then you pick up this one here. And it says, uh, it says number 72 and 2 on the base plate. So I guess they're kind of having trouble keeping it together. Uh, here's a later one. And you can see by the late 70s, um, they also were starting to introduce tampo printing instead of the, uh, the uh, lesser quality decals like this rat rod here, which they did, the decals didn't tend to age very well. Um, but something else odd about this one, if you roll it over, there's no number on the base plate. So some of them were starting to lose the numbering system. Um, I know I have a 1980 uh, police vehicle, number 20. Um, I also have one of the earlier ones too. I just haven't been able to find it. This one's still on the card. Um, and it says 1980 less new products of course number 20 on the card and also you can see there's a number 20 on the base plate there so i'm not exactly sure when they lost the numbering system but i know by the time that universal group bought them out in 1982 the numbering system at least on the base plates kind of disappeared forever there were a couple of exceptions um, like these macau made ones that were both during the tyco and the um, uh, universal group era uh, there is actually a number four right there in front of the rear axle. It's very hard to see. And maybe the reason they left that on there is nobody else could see it either. Maybe they just forgot. But usually they remove the uh, the numbering system uh, on those models, you know, moving up. Uh, kind of going around a little more, uh, just pointing out that not everything was super fast in the 1970s. Uh, that's a mid-70s purchase at Gandhi Toy Stores in Lakeland, Florida. And that's that beautiful number 75 Ferrari Berlinetta with that classic green paint job. But it's sporting those... Uh, Awesome earlier style cast uh, spoke wheels, really neat. Beautiful, beautiful model. Um, parked next to it is Tanzara, and that was another one of those futuristic deals that they did. I mostly wasn't really into that stuff. 
I like Tanzara because it had very futuristic looking, those cross wheels. And then when you open the, the rear there, it kind of had a semi-detailed chrome engine. I like the chrome. You know, a lot of vacuum metalized parts. And again, that amber glass over the uh, chrome. I just couldn't get enough of that. I mean, just, you know, looking at that stuff in the 70s, it just always amazed me how 50 cents would buy you, <laughs> buy you so much vehicle. Uh, all metal base plates. Uh, beautiful vehicle, uh, the Tanzara, from, I think from 1972, but I think that was a mid-70s purchase because I don't think they had those wheels in 72. I could be wrong there. Um, also, too, my Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. I know some of those, a uh, fair amount of them came with the super fast wheels. This one did not. Also a mid-70s purchase, uh, number 24. This is it on there. Yep, number 24, Rolls-Royce Silver Shadow. Also got my initials carved on the bottom. That's nice. Uh, part next to it is the uh, number 27 Lamborghini Countach of 1973. It also has a, uh, a semi-detailed engine bay. Kind of neat. And then it also has red glass over the chrome interior, which also gave it a very unique effect. Kind of an odd color choice, but it just kind of worked. This one does have a decal. It's not tampo printed. Uh, an earlier version, of course, right? 19, I believe it was 1973. Yep, 73. I think it was number 27. Yep. Pretty cool. Um, oh, no extra charge for that. Boom. There's the, uh, I think they called that the Blue Shark. Let me adjust my camera. Oh, yeah, there we go. Yep, number 61, Blue Shark, 1971. I actually got this in a trade uh, from a friend, and that was probably going on 50 years ago. I never liked to trade with him because his stuff was always kind of rough like this one was. In fact, it only had uh, three pipes on one side, and uh, my solution was to just pull the other one off and just make it a V6. <laughs> kind of weird, huh? I actually found out these are kind of pretty valuable in the collector world today. Too bad I didn't get it from him a few weeks earlier when he first got it. So, as you can see, they did have some prosperous times. Um, they had a lot of unique features. Um, you know, they had the, they had the Rollomatics, that line, you know, which was, you know, here's the Badger of 1973. I think it was number 10 in the lineup. Did I get that right? Yep. And you can see when it, when it rolled across, it had a, a moving part. The, uh, the radar antenna or dish would move. Kind of neat. Uh, beautiful copper metallic paint. Absolutely beautiful vehicle. Love the color. This is always one of my favorites for a Rollomatic. Um, and they did quite a few of those. Uh, here's the Weasel from 1973, metallic green. Supposedly those didn't sell very well. Um, this one was kind of unique about this one. I actually found this one uh, walking home from school one day. It was in a sand pile next to a house being built. There wasn't a mark on it. And somebody had just left it unattended. And I thought, well, okay, I'll give it a home. And I had it ever since. Kind of neat. I think the turret moves on it when you roll it. I think it still works. Maybe get to do that. Cool. I had some other Rollomatics there. Also, too, they did the boat thing. There's the Seafire. I never played with it very much. Uh, again, got the vacuum metalized uh, engine. Uh, it's got the super fast wheels tucked inside there. Kind of an odd deal. Uh, so Seafire 1975. Yeah, kind of cool. Also, you know, a decal. This one wasn't handled a lot. Some of the ones I liked and handled a lot, like the Rat Rod, and my friends handled it a lot, too. Everybody always wanted to play with this one. You can see the other yeah, decal on it is kind of... Uh, Kind of worn out. Paint doesn't look too worse for wear. This one did see a little outside duty, I guess. Uh, some of the other cool ones. How about Dragon Wheels? I think this was a mid-70s purchase. Uh, I know it's got 1972 on the base plate, um, but I think I probably got this in 74 or 75. You can see they kind of mix it up with two different styles of wheels. I'm sure they had different wheels on them, different versions. Uh, I know they have a repro version. It's called Dragon Wheels, spelled, I think, uh, G-G-I-N instead of G-O-N. Uh, kind of cool. Um, and just, for some reason, they're just not going to let that one go. Uh, moving around, I'll kind of try not to leave out any cool ones that I kind of showed. Uh, some of these are not less in the era, you know, like this reintroduction of the uh, the Challenger. That, I believe that was the Macau or China era there. So we'll touch on that for another another video. Here's a really neat one. There's the uh, the Mercury Cougar Villager wagon, mixing it up with the dot dash style wheels. No uh, chrome interior or anything, but that cool lime metallic paint. And it does have a tailgate that does open. Kind of cool. One of the last uh, Lesney uh, matchbox that I remember buying was at a TGNY in America's Georgia in 1982 or 83. And that's this one right here, the red one. It's parked in front of, I think, of a China Thunderbird. But this one does have Lesney on the base plate. 
And actually, we're putting the scale on them, which is kind of what Tomica did. And it says 1982 on there. So I believe that was one of the last ones that I got that actually was a lessening. And that was kind of the end of the run. Um, some other odd things they did. Um, this uh, Supa Koopa, I think, of 1972. Um, I don't know what they were thinking with this. I don't know if they had Larry Wood moonlighting uh, with them from Hot Wheels. Um, you see the side of it looks like totally looks like Mustang. And then it looks kind of like a Ford LTD in the front, kind of with the bumper missing, right? And then in the rear here, you've got the myers Banks thing going right with the VW engine hanging off the back. Kind of a tuck and roll interior. Looks like it's a four-seater, too. How about that? Uh, kind of an odd deal. Right-hand drive, too. Uh, really, really weird machine. Super Koopa, 1972. I think this might have been a later one. I don't think I don't know if they had those wheels in 72 or not. They mixed it up a lot with changing those super fast wheels. Again, trying to keep Hot Wheels on their toes because they just really just had the one style wheel. Uh, oh, there's another neat one. There's the, the car hauler. I think that was a 1976 version. Um, not a lot of detail on that. Yeah, 76. Number 11 car transporter. Kind of neat. There's another neat one I like. I like the Volkswagen Golf, although you know, over here we call them rabbits. Uh, also a right-hand drive. I think that was number seven in 1976 is when that was first cast. Kind of neat. Love the color. I always like those those uh, those green colors. Oh, create another avalanche here. So there we have it. I think I've kind of covered uh, some of the notable ones. Oh, there's the Ford Pantera. That was also a 1975 purchase. 75 was a big year for me, by the way. I bought a lot of these in 75. Um, I tended to be a casual collector. So you know, if they if they had a different color out the next year or something like that, um, I tended not to buy it. I would just stick with which, whichever one I had or the color I liked. Um, and sometimes I collect other makes too. I collected a lot of Tomica and you know Cor and some Corgi and then a fair amount of Hot Wheels as well, probably like everybody else did. Um, but I think I kind of covered uh, everything here. I kind of wanted to talk about, and I think we'll just end this video up. And I'm going to kind of show you. I'll, I'll line a bunch of them up. And we'll just show you from start to finish that that awesome Lesney Golden era. And there it is, the Golden Era, the Evolutionary Era, the Lesney Era. From its humble beginnings in 1953, by the late 50s, the Matchbox had grown in size, it gained a base plate, and the numbering system is now in place. The early 60s saw glazed windows and injection molded plastic wheels. By the mid 60s, most cars had interiors, some had opening and closing doors, and chrome disc wheels first appeared in 1968. By 1970, they had to answer to Hot Wheels Challenge, and they answered super fast. And here's an early version of super fast with the thin wheels. Some of the earlier models could not accept the wider wheels like this Maserati Bora has, as well as this Lamborghini Countach. Noticing that they, both of these models do have the wide wheels, but also noticing both of these models of around the same era, uh, the 1973 uh, base plate Countach and the 1972 base plate Maserati, they have two different styles of first generation super fast. One has the square spokes, the other one has the pie shaped spokes. Also pointing out that the super fast thin wheels basically had the same design as these spokes on the Maserati. Also pointing out that the trucks also got a redesign, like this number 10 pipe truck, for example, and it got the solid uh, thick axles replaced with the music wire style axles and also accommodated the uh, early thin style super fast due to the design of the truck. Kind of neat. Also pointing out some of the unique features they started doing in the 70s when they were competing with Hot Wheels. They added a lot of neat features, you know, like an opening and closing hatch uh, on the camper opening and closing doors on this Maserati, some very unique uh, metallic colors, uh, and also they had the uh, unique tinted glass over the vacuum metalized interiors on some models, uh, also pointing out vacuum metalized engine bay on this Lamborghini Countach, Absol absolutely stunning. Uh, they also had this four spoke style uh, wheel show up as well, uh, and I kind of refer to most of these uh, 70s era Matchbox wheels as corporate wheels because they were not bashful about mixing it up and using different style wheels. Uh, they would have big and littles like the Planet Scout. Uh, and then they also had these really cool ones that came out in the mid 70s as seen on the number one Dodge Challenger. Uh, and I call these the, I, actually these are called the five arch style wheels by collectors. Um, also pointing out they had a vacuum metalized interior. It had a textured roof that kind of simulated a vinyl, a vinyl top, kind of neat. 
maybe supposed to look like a convertible roof, not exactly sure, um, but just absolutely love this car. And again, all of them had, you know, metal base plates, uh, die cast metal bodies. They're basically metal vehicles with some plastic parts, kind of neat. Um, they also mix it up on this dump truck with the Spiro style wheel. Uh, and just pointing out that it was kind of unique that this wheel did actually cross uh, different styles of Matchbox, like the Speed King here with the 1970 base plate. I think it's the K27 Camper. It also used the exact same size and style wheel. These were actually the same wheel. So a 164 scale and then a, I guess a 143-ish scale shared the same wheels. Kind of unique. Uh, the Planet Scout also mixed it up, right? Tinted, amber tinted glass, vacuum metalized. Uh, interior and also other vacuum metalized parts and mix it up with big and littles noticing that it's got the uh, the dot dash style wheel in the rear and the five arch in the front and just pointing out that the dot dash was nothing more than a first gen super fast with little holes punched in the spokes kind of a neat way to give it a modern look and kind of keep hot wheels on its toes uh, with many different styles of wheels and i know matchbox collectors i know at least i was i was always very wheel conscious and i really enjoyed all the different styles of wheels whereas hot wheels kind of just had the one style right they had those uh early ones with the delrin inserts they had the closed uh, style uh, wheel as well as well as this one on this uh beach beach bomb i think by the time they had done away with the delrin inserts they still had kind of a solid style wheel um, but they did eventually go to pass through axle style wheels just like matchbox seen on this mid 70s uh, hot wheels here kind of mimicking that same style you know where they have the, the big hole in the center of the wheel kind of neat um, just pointing out on the 75 Firebird, uh, it used the dot dash wheels as well. Also on the Cougar used the dot dash and they look both stunning on either vehicle. Just pointing out they spent a little extra money on the Pontiac uh, with the vacuum metalized interior. Uh, whereas on the, uh, on the wagon, they basically just used a yellow plastic interior. It did have an opening and closing tailgate though. Also kind of mixing it up towards the end of the run here. They started adding tampo printing to some models. This is a 1979 base plate. It also mixes it up with a different style wheel in the rear called the crown style. And it's a little different because it basically, uh, the little tangs protrude from the outer edge inward, as opposed to the five arch where the little tangs go from the inside of the hub and protrude outward. So two different style wheels, kind of subtle at first until you really start studying them. I've been staring at these things for over 50 years though. Uh, also pointing out here, here's the, uh, the Mustang with the Maltese cross style wheels, uh, mixing it up with big and littles has that unique uh, semi-detailed chrome engine bay lifting hood and also has that cool amber tint and glass over a vacuum metalized interior. Also, you know, die cast metal base plate. These are very solid. They're very heavy, heavy feeling. These were high quality replicas. Maybe not the biggest on detail, right, compared to some of these uh, boutique, uh, I guess like um, some of the later Johnny Lightnings and with some of the RC2 and green light, right? But this, none of that stuff was around then. This, is, this was what you had. And uh, they were high quality. They had really nice paint jobs. Kind of neat, kind of a neat era. Uh, I really hated to see this era end. And by 1982, uh, Matchbox went into receivership. Kind of a sad deal. Here's the last one I bought. I think I mentioned that earlier. And also pointing out there's no numbering system on this one. And this is dated 1982, uh, Lesney, England. This was one of the last uh, uh, Lesney products that I bought uh, before they became uh, Universal Group. Um, and Matchbox International. And let me just bring up Universal Group for a moment. Um, they also shamelessly copied uh, Matchbox before they actually bought them out. Actually, there was a lot of people copying Matchbox. So you can see this uh, number 16 Badger of 1973 has that beautiful copper metallic paint job, also Rollomatic. I think I mentioned that earlier. But you can see on the Kidco here of 1979, uh, which was a Universal Group product designed to compete with Matchbox over here in the States. They shamelessly copied that Maltese cross style wheel as well. You also had other companies like Tomica that wanted to compete on quality. And boy, do they compete on quality. You talk about precision opening and closing doors. Uh, I never got one with a, a dud. I never got a dud out of the box with a bad paint job, but you can see how they shamelessly copied uh, the Matchbox super fast with their wheel as well. Uh, also pointing out you had other competitors that were lesser quality uh, like Zilmex that kind of copied the super fast as well. And then you had Ertl. Uh, kind of a market of themselves as Dyersville, Iowa, uh, kind of another, uh, kind of a lower quality, lower tier vehicle, in my opinion, kind of looked like it was made by Universal Group, also made in Hong Kong, um, like the Hot Wheels, you know, so they had that same formula. They used very cheap labor, um, and that's kind of, they basically competed on price. They didn't really compete on quality. Uh, the only one that really competed on quality, in my opinion, was the Tomica, and those were top notch. Uh, and then you also had Corgi, uh, that kind of sort of copied the super fast. Um, but it was kind of, 
uh, I guess it was it was done in kind of a different way. I never really kind of took those as super fast uh, and very not a whole lot of detail on these. You can tell the Corgis they didn't spend a lot of money on them. No vacuum metalized parts. Uh, very dull kind of alkyd enamel type paint jobs. I didn't have many of these that were shiny um, except for maybe my Kojak Buick. That's about it. Uh, just pointing out that uh, all three British manufacturers, uh, because they all paid somewhere between 50 and 83 percent corporate tax rate uh, at the time, I know in the late 70s, uh, all of them went bankrupt. So that included uh, Matchbox, included Corgi, and it also included Dinky Toys. They all went belly up, I think, within three years of each other. Uh, and so all of those, I think, manufacturers began uh, to have their parts made overseas in Hong Kong. Uh, and then I guess Macau and then Thailand, but just pointing out Universal Group, uh, they kind of made, you know, mediocre quality stuff like Kidco. The first exposure I had to Universal Group was the Champ of the Road series of cars, which was a Kmart exclusive. And this was a set of four vehicles that were all equally uh, poorly designed and built. Uh, they had mediocre paint jobs. Um, they kind of had mediocre detail. You see on the Corvette, they decided not to put posts on the windshield. They didn't even paint them in. Kind of like last minute, they decided it wouldn't actually be a Roadster. Never really got that. Um, the Thunderbird was okay-ish. I thought the scale on it was decent. It kind of had that same quality. It's kind of like this Ertl did. Um, 56 Chevy was my favorite. Just pointing out this 57 Chevy, this is a loose one out of the box, just like that one. Uh, the quality on them was so poor, it kind of looked more like a Plymouth in the front than a Chevy. Uh, just poorly scaled. Uh, the axles didn't line up with the fender wells very well. Uh, they were kind of off-center. I always thought they were kind of canted rearward. Uh, just the proportions are poor. You can kind of see through the paint. It's a very muddy uh, orange paint. It almost looks like easel paint. A very low quality alkyd enamel. Um, just, just low quality stuff. And it kind of showed when they first took them over uh, in 82. Uh, one of my first Hong Kong vehicles that I got. I think the only one I have that remains. Uh, and we'll pick that up in the next video uh, when we talk about Universal Group. But just one other thing I wanted to leave you with is uh, when I stopped at a gas station in the mid 80s. It was a Chevron. And I saw these unique models, and I thought, gosh, those look like models of yesteryear. You had the had the uh, the Model T, and then you had this cool, I think it's a 39 or 40 Chevy truck. 39 Chevy pickup, yep. Uh, and on the bottom, it says, the Leto name, symbol, and days gone are trademarks of Leto. And guess what Leto is? That's Jack O'Dell's name backwards. So he kept the models of yesteryear and renamed them days gone. How fitting, right? So he was still on there swinging hard in the middle 80s uh, after he did lose his company. Kind of sad, uh, just also pointing out one of the other models I bought, which I thought was really neat, was the uh, the Dennis Fire engine of 1934. And you know what's neat about that? That was the ninth vehicle in their lineup in the 50s. How fitting, huh? So he kind of did a Super King version uh, of his Dennis Fire engine. So I thought, how cool. Uh, and on that, we will let you go. And next week, we'll pick up on the Universal Group era. Thanks for watching, and we'll talk to you later.